Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to welcome everyone watching on ITV and via Zoom webinar to the September 22nd, 2020 regular meeting to order with all board members present. And interpretation services are available for this meeting in Spanish, Vietnamese, Somali, Tagalog, Swahili, and Arabic. And those uh, phone numbers will be um, displayed on the screen at some point for the different uh, translations. So at this point, please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Mm -hmm. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Okay, uh, to begin today, I would like a motion uh, to adopt uh, today's agenda. So moved. Second. Moved and seconded by Whitehurst Payne and Beiser. Uh, we will take the roll call on this. Uh, Trustee Patterson. Aye. Barrera. Beiser. Aye. McQuarrie. Aye. Whitehurst Payne. Aye. And Evans, aye. Okay, that passes 5 0. We have now adopted the agenda for today. Uh, today's meeting of the Board of Education is a business meeting of our board conducted in public, and we're in compliance with the state of California uh, rules for public meetings and also with the coronavirus uh, uh, outbreak directives. So therefore, we only accept written uh, public testimony, which we'll be reading uh, at the meeting when the agenda items come up or at the uh, end of the meeting. When people want to submit public testimony, please remember uh, to limit your uh, written statement to uh, 150 words. We can get to as many as possible uh, within the time limits and uh, submitted um, for the day of the meeting, okay? So now we will move on to uh, the recognition of employees for many years of service for 5, 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years of service, the long service, serving members of our district, which we, uh, whom we want to honor today. Um, do we have any public speakers on this item? No, we do not. Okay, I will turn this over to uh, Superintendent Martin. Thank you, President Evans. So this evening, I'd like to rec take some time to celebrate some good news. You might remember that the last time we held a board meeting in person was on March 3rd, 2020. And at that time, we celebrated some of our most cherished employees, those that had completed over 40 years of service with San Diego Unified School District. So tonight, I'm happy to announce that we are going to once again congratulate some of our most treasured veteran employees. And we're gonna start these much deserved recognitions. We're gonna do it on a monthly basis. Today, what we're doing is honoring more than 1,400 employees with 40, 30, 20, 15, 10, and five years of service. So, okay, while we're not able to shake each other's hands and have every one of you here in person, we would like to send you a virtual hug, handshake, pat on the back, congratulations. And once you return to on-site, each employee is going to receive a service pin and this pin represents our gratitude for your many years of dedication to our district, to our communities, and most of all, to our students. You've been through many triumphs and challenges during your tenure, and yet you always step up and you serve our organization. You truly make San Diego a better place. So at this time, I'd like to introduce you to some of these incredibly dedicated San Diego Unified employees. Let's roll the video, please. Hello, my name is Araceli Jimenez. I have been an educator for 30 years with San Diego Unified, and I'm currently a resource teacher at Golden Hill K-8. 
I think every teacher's dream is to have their hard work, perseverance, and dedication make an impact in the lives of the children and the families they touch. It has given me tremendous joy and satisfaction to serve our school communities. I was blessed to have had the most outstanding, most kind, and knowledgeable master teacher, Gloria Aguilar, who promised to share all she knew about teaching if I stayed and worked alongside her. She is the reason why I initially stayed with San Diego Unified, and this testimonial is in her honor. 30 years is a long time to stay in, to stay in one district, but the relationships I built with many parents and students has been, for me, the most rewarding. So you want to stay connected to that. One of my favorite things about my job is to be able to honor my culture and my ability to incorporate my first language in what I do. But most importantly, to have my second language students see themselves in me. We need to show um, students out there in the community that um, people of color um, have success in their careers and that we're here, that we are part of our educational system. And so for me today, was really a way to honor uh, Gloria, um, but also to honor my roots. My name is Derek Murchison. I am the principal at Zamorano Fine Arts Academy, and I've been part of San Diego Unified School District for 20 years. I'm extremely proud um, and, and honored to, to be part of this district and honored that uh, my years of service have been honored and valued. Um, and it's a tribute to the people who I've been around. My mother was a teacher and uh, she had a long lasting impact on what I do today. Um, one of my favorite teachers uh, still is in contact with me. He was my sixth grade teacher. So as I am um, able to do the things that I'm doing, I'm carrying on their legacy because they helped me put me in the place that I am. And hopefully I can do the same thing for another, uh, another person, adult, a child, uh, help them um, see their dreams and be able to have an impact on the people they serve. I chose San Diego Unified and why I continue to stay with San Diego Unified um, is relationships and the opportunities. I've had opportunities to be a teacher, opportunities to be a resource teacher to support other teachers. I've worked in administrations for as vice principal and principal and uh, just to, uh, the opportunities to work with children, work with adults to help um, children reach their goals and their dreams. The highlights of my career have been just seeing the light bulb go on our, on our children's heads and seeing them, them shine and be so proud of themselves. It's not for me about a title or about a position. Um, just like our superintendent says, it's about the work. And I'm honored to be able to do the work that I love to do in San Diego Unified. Um, my why is really strong in this district because our district supports my why, which is bringing people together to do great work for children, and that's all I want to do. My name is Shekila Atmer. <coughs> I'm a food service worker, number one, and I'm working for 20 years. Today is my 20 years exactly, and I'm so proud of I work in the school districts. I can imagine I'm working 20 years. For me, it's like a year, honestly. <laughs> When I started the job, my kids was in, in kindergarten, my children. And then I was so happy to work with my kids in the school. That's why I applied for the school districts, to be with the kids and help them. But my favorite part was uh, really, it was so special. That was the time when we serving the food with the kids, when they smiling us. That was the most, my favorite part. I never absent, I never have absent for 20 years. Maybe I, for 20 years, I never did school for no reason, except my mom was passed away. I'm not coming to job for five, four days. The otherwise, always I was in the job. I love extremely my job and I'm very happy for the strikes and the people with my manager and my supervisor, everybody was, I'm very proud of them to give us opportunity to work with them. Over there, but they're conducted through ITV. You're there, I'm sorry, man. The people watching the video um, probably won't be able to hear anything. Okay. 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 I just want to say thank you again to everybody, to 
the voices you just heard to all of the people we're recognizing honor you for your commitment, for your service. And I have tears in my eyes as I listen to each person's story. And they just are just a representation of all of the employees that we're recognizing tonight. And I'm not sure what I enjoyed more, the videos or also watching our chief of human resources, Acacia Thede. She had tears in her eyes like a proud mama watching all of the employees. I see you, Acacia, and I know that you're proud. And thank you to our HR department for helping to coordinate and put this together along with everybody on the team that made tonight's video possible. But most importantly, it's about recognizing our beloved employees for their years of service. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Superintendent Martin, and for that recognition of our employees and whether they've been here five years, 10 years, or 40 years, none of them have ever seen a year like we have been through or the last six months that we've been through. And we appreciate the steadfastness of our employees through all of these uh, challenging times as we keep moving forward. Uh, we will now move to uh, on closed session. Uh, I do not believe, uh, Ms. Green, there are any reports from closed session. Is that correct? Okay. That's the information I have. There are no reportable actions. Uh, we will now go to uh, Superintendent Martin. Are there any administrative assignments? No, President Evans. There are no assignments this evening. Okay. Stable staff. No new uh, assignments at this point. So now we're going to move to our next part, which is a good part, which is our ASB students who are who are living through these uh, changing times. Uh, we always have them come uh, into the board meetings to talk about what's going on in their schools, both academically and socially. And today uh, we have uh, two student body presidents. Uh, one is Michelle and I will try to pronounce your last name, uh, Hagariles, and you can correct me on that, Michelle, and uh, who is the ASB president at Morse High School, and Kaylee Shadburn, ASB president at Scripps Ranch High School. So let's start with uh, Michelle. Good evening, my name is Michelle Hagariles, and I am representing Morse High School as ASB president for the school year 2020 to 2021. Uh, similar to every other school in the district, Morris moved forward with full implementation of distance learning, which is a new experience for the student body, teachers, and staff. In the beginning, many were concerned that it would be unorganized and struggle to find a way to start off motivated. However, now it is seen as a beneficial challenge as students needed to improve on their work ethic. Distance learning requires one to be able to work under pressure and aim for skills such as managing their time, speech making, organizing, and innovating their work. And despite me being able to perform best when work is tangible, I took it as an opportunity to gain a better grasp on technology. Most teachers, professors, and students at Morse High use learning tools such as Google Classroom, Canvas, and Zoom, which do not require them to be tech savvy. Um, Aside from this, students find themselves communicating more with teachers and professors through emails and other messaging apps like Remind. Social media, especially Instagram, um, is also an important platform for students to stay connected and be consistently informed of upcoming events and announcements. For instance, the Morse ASB Council and I recently planned out our first Spirit Week, which had a significant amount of participation due to the electronic flyers and videos we shared. In fact, we still have a lot of ideas formulating in regards to improving online school for our students, particularly we, particularly we desire community where our freshmen feel welcomed and are guided through high school experience. And to accomplish this, Morse ASB plans to impose a mentorship program incorporating how high school conferences and freshman orientations are run. The purpose for this is to introduce a sense of familiarity between freshmen and their upperclassmen and to have someone to lean on and be able to question certain classes, experiences, and extracurriculars. Um, adding along to the imperative announcements, ASB also helps spread awareness to the students culturally and mentally. We hold special events regarding these situations that are happening within the month, the year, etc. And all in all, we are on board for a safer, more validated, and successful in both traditional and technological, technological aspects community in Morse High School. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michelle. 
And now let's go to Scripps uh, Ranch High School with Kaylee. Hi, everyone. My name is Kaylee Shadburn, and I am the senior ASB president at Scripps Ranch High School for the year 2020 to 2021. Um, similar to Michelle, of course, our school has decided to do online and our classrooms via Zoom this year. And I think distance learning has taken definitely some getting used to, but it has been seeming to work fairly smoothly so far. Um, speaking on behalf of the students, I know that nobody is quite thrilled about the distance learning, but our high school has done a great job at providing us all with the resources we need to succeed. Um, of course, it is normal for students to study, struggle with technical difficulties every so often, but our staff has been working around the clock to give questions on how to work through those challenges. Um, our teachers have also been so helpful with every step of the way. Personally, I have been communicating with all my teachers, mostly over Zoom or during their office hours. Um, also made it very clear to all the students that they're able to ask questions or communicate via email or learning platforms such as Google Classroom or Canvas as well. Um, by doing so, I think students feel more at ease knowing that they are not alone and the teachers are supporting them in every way that they can. Um, in addition um, to teachers, students seem to be finding help through communication with their peers as well. Um, given that Zoom is kind of a very different environment, I think um, one con to that environment is that it makes it much more difficult to meet new people and communicate with classmates. So it seems to be that students are sticking to communication through friends that they previously had prior to the shutdown. But ASB has been working on providing new resources for kids to connect outside of the classroom. Um, so we're currently in the midst of our club application process and engaging our students and trying to encourage them to get involved in all activities outside of the classroom. Um, given that a club meeting is much more comfortable to socialize in than a classroom environment is, um, we hope that people are, our students are given an opportunity to talk with new people and make strong connections that they can use as communication outlets throughout the year. Um, I'm so proud of my high school for the situation um, and how they're handling it so far, but overall I'm most proud of the school for the community that they're creating in this new setting. We have boosted the idea that we're all in this together and as a family, we can get through the difficulties while finding a sense of team inspiration as well. Um, in conclusion, I think that we, the more we build upon this foundation, the better our school will become. And in the end, we'll come out of this year stronger than ever before with a new look on the way we operate our classrooms. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Michelle and Kaylee. Um, your words are really important to us and your optimism and and in spite of the, the difficulties and challenges that you are facing. And it's a pretty good example of um, dealing with the situation that many of us adults could use as an example. Uh, the, um, a psychologist I know wrote a book that was actually about uh, kids with learned disabilities and, and kids who had gone through traumas, but the name of the book was Playing a Poor Hand Well. We don't have control over the card, all the cards that were dealt in life, but we do have a responsibility to do the best we can with the hand we are dealt. And I think both of these uh, ASB presidents are um, epitomizing that. And I think it's also um, fitting that we have uh, two this evening two female uh, ASB presidents uh, after the passing of uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Uh, who made so much possible, uh, really, from uh, the, there was a, a cadet, a, a female cadet at, a, a, at the Virginia Military Academy who was, was grateful for what Ruth Bader Ginsburg had done the year she was born, had opened their school up to females and many other things across the nation in terms of the, the opportunities for women as, as uh, epitomized by uh, Justice uh, Ginsburg. Okay. Now we're going to move on to uh, superintendent's uh, information reports. Superintendent Martin. Thank you, President Evans, and definitely thank you for recognizing these young women who are role models for so many students across our district, and your words were really powerful tonight, Michelle and Kaylee, and I especially love hearing about how you're finding ways to connect with each other, and not just the groups that you already knew, but how to find ways to connect to people you didn't know, even though you can't be together. And that's what community is like. That's what community is about. And you are not walking away from community. You're actually stepping into it and being leaders. And so you truly inspire me and you're inspiring our whole city. I appreciate both of you so much. And thank you, Dr. Evans, for your comments about leadership and women in leadership. Tonight, what I want to do is acknowledge the very difficult milestone 
that our nation has passed this week. And just the fact that 200,000 of our fellow Americans have now died due to the coronavirus. This number is so large that it's easy to lose sight of the fact that each death represents a family's loss, a light that's gone out in the world, a real loss to a family. And the world lost a bright light last week. As you mentioned, Dr. Evans, a woman who was a personal hero to me and to many young women and girls, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. For those of you who are tempted to despair by this current crisis, I want to urge you to remember Ruth Bader Ginsburg. I want to urge you to talk to your children, talk about what's possible for a courageous woman to achieve. Speaking of courage to finally tonight, I want to remember a San Diego hero, Charles Morton. He's a firefighter who died fighting the El Dorado fire last week, a firefighter from San Diego. <laughs> These are difficult times for all of us, but we have plenty of heroes to help. In California alone, more than 60,000 school-aged children have been infected with the coronavirus. This is a crisis, but I just wanna share one more number. Today, the working men and women in our own food services department, our heroes of San Diego Unified, served their five millionth meal since the start of the crisis. That's what we mean when we say our schools make San Diego a better place to live. Thank you, Dr. Evans. Thank you, Superintendent Martin. Okay, we will now go to uh, board uh, information reports. Uh, let's start with uh, student uh, trustee Patterson. Thank you, President Evans. We definitely faced a difficult loss last week, as Superintendent Martin said, and both of our ASB presidents. As the first, uh, as, the, as the second woman on the Supreme Court and the first Jewish woman to serve on the United States Supreme Court, she sure was a trailblazer. And Ruth really defied many of the barriers that we put in place in our society. And she proved that you can get over the barriers that are put in front of you. She described when she lived there trying to become a lawyer, talking about being a mother, being Jewish, and being a woman and how difficult that is. And yet she found a way to overcome it. And yet she recognized the struggles she faced and she was able to effectively move forward and end up becoming a champion for so many in this nation. And it was really painful. And as Superintendent Martin said, we're facing a crisis on multiple fronts and it's a very, very difficult time, but there are things to be optimistic about. I'm proud to say that last week, California made immense progress with the passage of AB331, the ability to have ethnic studies in our school system starting in the 2029, 2030 school year. San Diego Unified is already way ahead of that, but that's for statewide. I was proud to be a part of a rally speaking with Dolores Huerta uh, and Shirley Weber on the different important things that we're talking about in ethnic studies and the representation that we need in order to create a curriculum that represents the diversity and the beauty of the state of California. And I think that there's a lot of great things moving forward in recognizing the fact that our students are going to continue to succeed. As our ASB presidents described, it's been a difficult few weeks to get started. And I know personally, the workload's been a bit of a shift and it's very unusual having to complete all of this from home. But slowly but surely, we're finding our way to get back there. And I think that just as I read out with five different student statements at our last meeting, talking about how students felt optimistic for the school year moving forward, I still feel that optimism there. And I'm excited to say that I think everyone's putting in the work and the effort to get the job done and we're ready to go back to school when we can, but until then, we're gonna make the best of what we have. Thank you, Trustee Patterson and uh, Vice President Barrera. Yeah, all, all the words that we've heard from uh, our ASB representatives, from our student uh, representatives. Trustee Barrera, we can't hear you. 
Can you, can you take out your earphones maybe? Does this work? Yeah. Try again. You do too. Uh, we, there's always a little glitch here with technology. Uh, we'll move on to Trustee Beiser. Uh, yeah, thank you, President Evans. Um, over the last couple of weeks, I've been meeting uh, with some uh, teachers that are very interested in providing some positive input about our early childhood education program and ways that we can continue to um, always, you know, reflect on how we provide early childhood education and make it better. Um, I've also been uh, meeting with uh, and visiting with a lot of families and parents and students about the, some of the things that are going on and ways that we can make them better and answer a lot of questions about this COVID situation, online learning, um, especially from a teacher's perspective where I'm actually teaching math online through distance learning in the Sweetwater School District. It's really been very helpful when I've had been having my weekly meetings with the Superintendent Martin or regular meetings with Superintendent Martin as we discuss our position and where we are to get a lot of questions answered. So I want to thank Superintendent Cindy Martin for always being available and uh, answering questions and helping to uh, parents and families to understand where we are and where we're going. Thank you, President Evans. Okay, thank you, Trustee Beiser and Trustee Brewer. Are you ready? Uh, I hope so. Does this work? I, I can hear you, but I'm right next to you. <laughs> <laughs> no uh, one's, everyone can hear him, I believe. Shake your head, yes. Everyone can hear him? All right. All right. Uh, listen, I'll just uh, very quickly, uh, Dr. Whitehurst Payne and I had an opportunity this week to be out at Sherman Elementary uh, as we uh, move forward with returning our weekend meal distribution. and. <laughs> I just think the work that Gary Patel, our food service workers, um, everybody that's been part of that uh, that effort has really been incredible, including our advocacy to the federal government to extend our waiver so that we can resume our uh, weekend meal service. So the five millionth meal, again, is the product of incredible effort on the part of so many people that have been out there since uh, since the shutdown and um, and 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 trying to and and with our ability to now get our weekend meals um, and hopefully soon our evening meals uh, back, we know that the impact that that makes on the community. So thank you, Gary, and thank you, food, food service team. Okay, um, Trustee McQuarrie. Yeah, so I wanna thank Superintendent Martin for calling attention to our employees. And I too want to acknowledge uh, and to thank them for their years of service. Uh, we have a much better school district because of the quality of employees we can hire, we can maintain and train and and uh, uh, retain. So I wanna, th wanna thank them. I also wanna call attention to uh, women's suffrage uh, and the passage of the, uh, the 19th Amendment, which gave uh, women the right to vote uh, and remind everyone that the, uh, the right to vote is only a right if you take action and use it. I encourage everyone to vote. Uh, between now and November, uh, your election and our leaders matter. Uh, we know that with the uh, there was the loss of the 200,000 um, citizens across the country could have been uh, much less if we had much better leadership. Let's use our right to vote to select the best leaders. Let's get the best leaders in the country and let's move, uh, let's move uh, forward uh, where we can heal and bring progress uh, to, uh, to, the, to this country. Okay, thank you, Trustee McQuarrie. And now, uh, Trustee Whitehurst Payne. Thank you, Dr. Evans. And I would like to just say thank you also to the staff for those who have spent all of that time in the district. I commend um, the infamous, as they call her, uh, RBG. She was really um, just an amazing lady and a role model for all females. If uh, there's no way you could not appreciate what she did for all of us. This week, I spent some time out uh, canvassing or collecting signatures with the group called Frontline that's working on behalf of the Mount Hope community to ensure that they do not get a marijuana dispensary near the Costco building before they get something to assist children, uh, recreational facilities, et cetera. So we're trying to. Um, 
go before the city council with some names of residents of folks who do not want that to come into the community. But what I wanna spend my time today talking about is the kindergartners. As somebody said, they're near and dear to my heart. And I must say that as a teacher, having started at Roosevelt Junior High School in O'Farrell and then on to Mission Bay High School, and, um, you know, and later went on to the university, community college, et cetera. The kindergarten level, I don't think folks realize uh, why we're having such difficulty with that level. At the, at the university level, they're depending upon the high school level to get things right. And they'll comment sometimes, what are they doing at that level? And then the high school teachers comment, well, those middle school teachers are not doing their job. And then the middle school teachers, what are those elementary school teachers doing? But believe it or not, the first through the sixth grade uh, teachers will say, what are those Ks doing? because that sets the foundation for the entire schooling experience. And it's not all about the academics, it's about the whole socialization process. Uh, when I had an intern program in this district, the kindergarten level is the most critical because that's when children learn, I, I can leave mom, I don't have to hide behind her skirt, I don't have to ride on her, her waistline, I mean, you know, have her to hold me in her arms. I can stand on my two feet and I can um, raise my hand when I need to be heard, sit down when the teacher tells me. It's the whole culturalization process. And that's why a lot of parents are having difficulty right now. When I um, listen to the groups of uh, Latinos and Somali and various Arabic and so on, this summer in the mid-city community, out of all the complaints, the kindergarten complaint was a consistent one. What do I do with this child? And so I'm telling you all that because I want you to realize that they're still hiding and they're still, parents are still having difficulty with them, but we absolutely need them to engage in school because that's the level, that's where they found, find their foundation. That's where they are indoctrinated into the schooling process. So if you're listening to me and you hear me talking now, if you know of a child, if there's one in your home, you have a second or third grade, but the kindergartner doesn't wanna go, please, please go by your school and check in with the principal, let folks know I have a K here and he or she does not want to go to school, but I think maybe it's time and I'm willing to try letting that child go. Take them by the school and ask the principal to help you with that child to decide what's best and how to get them hooked up to the laptops. And we know that eventually when we start bringing folks back, that will be the group we will look at for our highest priority because we need them back so that they can learn what schooling is all about. Uh, I mean, it's everybody who's listening to me, if you're a student in school, if you're just a community, a neighbor, whoever you are, you may know a kindergarten child. Please, please, please help the family to release that child to at least get started with the educational process and you won't regret it. I know in the beginning, it feels like the adult and the the two adults, the teacher and the parent are the two going to kindergarten. The child is sitting there looking at you like you're crazy, but please make that effort to bring them into the fold. And um, we'll appreciate it because down the road, a second grade teacher will say, oh, that K teacher did a good job. And a fifth grade teacher will say, oh, that K teacher did a good job and so on right down the line. So I appreciate your, your assisting all of us with that endeavor. Thank you, President. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Whitehurst Payne, for those words about kindergarten. I'm sure that kindergarten parents are some of the parents who are most concerned about when we're going to return to in-person learning. And this is the question all across the city. When are we going to reopen the schools to in-person learning? And um, I ask myself that question every day too, because we all want it to happen very soon. But it's not as simple as just putting a, a, throwing a dart at the calendar and saying X date we will start because we don't want to uh, reopen suddenly and then have to close and reopen and go back and forth. 
uh, we decided on a phased approach, which means we're, we're relying on our scientists at USCSD to guide us into doing this in a very careful way, which will also include very careful uh, testing and tracing. And so we're about to enter into very soon to phase one, which is for our most vulnerable students, whether they're homeless or some special education students, some others, uh, low achievers who, who need some extra in-person help. And, and they will be coming back to our campuses and it really serve two purposes because on the one hand, it will provide them with the extra academic help that they need. And will also give us a chance to put into practice some of the protocols uh, on a smaller scale in terms of having students and teachers uh, together on campus. And then we will subsequently bring the other students back in, in a phased approach. And so everyone really should be cheering for the success of this first phase, because that's what will lead us to being able to uh, bring other students back to campus. And of course, starting with uh, the very youngest students, as Dr. Whitehurst Payne mentioned, the, particularly the, the kindergartners. So we all need to still do our part in the community to control the spread of the virus. Uh, we're right on the edge in terms of having uh, more closures in San Diego County. Uh, if we're above 7.0, uh, there are more closures. We're right now at 6.9, which is again, uh, right on the edge. Uh, we're being, paying very close attention to our uh, public health officials uh, in terms of wearing masks, everybody wearing a mask. Uh, social distancing, washing hands, all the things that we know we need to do. This is not a political issue. Uh, this is a, a public health issue. And we're also very appreciative of all of our staff, both the support staff and, and the teaching staff in terms of their uh, getting in there and doing the best job they can under these circumstances. We've had a lot of cooperation. And just for people to understand, uh, for example, with our teacher group, was the first, one of the first in the state to agree to a, a distance learning plan last spring. Uh, they worked closely with district staff on developing a more comprehensive distance learning plan for the fall and also for the uh, in-person appointments that we're going to be starting uh, for the most vulnerable students. And we'll continue working together as we go through the various phases. So more than a particular date, we just need to keep in mind that there are phases and we'll move through these phases because we know that the virus is, is not going to go away. It's not going to magically disappear. Uh, and no matter what happens, even in terms of uh, research and a vaccine and so forth and the timing of that, we're really looking at having to deal with perhaps the next one to two years of dealing with uh, this situation. And so we want to open in a way that is sustainable with all the ups and downs of the pandemic as it happens over the coming months and years. So please keep that in mind. There's not a specific date, but there is a specific plan that we are uh, putting in place to get our kids back to uh, in-person learning. So after the board reports, we'll now move on to uh, the board consent agenda. Is there a motion on the board consent agenda? Move. Okay, moved by Trustee McQuarrie and Second. seconded by Trustee Whitehurst Payne. Uh, we will now, if there are no comments on the board consent agenda, which is recognizing Filipino American uh, Heritage Month, uh, LGBTQIA History Month, uh, October, October as National Bullying Prevention Month, and also appointments to the Charter School uh, Committee, a uh, facility committee. Um, so if there are no comments, uh, we will move yeah, forward on that. Sorry, Dr. Evans, Just one forward. comment from Trustee Patterson, please. Yeah, thank you. Speak. Just on the National Bullying uh, prevention. Talking about that, I know I thought ASB is district-wide since I've been paying more attention to that at all of our schools, looking at how they have promoted the ideas of suicide prevention and talking about that this month. And I really hope to see that continuity and working together. And I think we as a district can do a good job, maybe working to make sure our staff are providing those resources and doing a better job communicating. Because I think now in these times specifically, cyberbullying is really a large issue and something that we're facing that is systemic within social media and Instagram, Snapchat, and the different platforms we use as students. And I think it's critical that we provide that communication and that the district provides those resources to students directly. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Trustee Patterson. Okay, uh, if there are no further comments, uh, we will now vote on the board uh, consent agenda, starting with Trustee Patterson. Aye. Barrera? Aye. Pfizer? Aye. McQuarrie? Aye. Whitehurst Payne? Aye. And Evans, aye. That passes 5 0, along with our student uh, board member. We're now going to move on to operational matters reserved for the board. 
And item G1 is resolution 73, authorizing the transfer of district budgetary funds between expenditure classifications after June 30th, 2020, a, a routine um, measure that we take in terms of moving funds after the June 30th uh, end of the uh, fiscal year. Uh, is there a motion on this item? Moved by Trustee Barrera. Second. And seconded by Trustee Beiser. Are there any uh, board member questions or comments on this uh, particular item, which is routine? Okay. If, uh, if there are no further comments, then we will vote on this item. Uh, Trustee Patterson? Aye. Barrera? Aye. Beiser? Aye. McQuarrie? Aye. Whitehurst Payne? Aye. And Evans, aye. That passes 5 0 along with our student board member. Now we'll go on to item G2, with is a ratification of a tentative agreement with the Administrators Association of San Diego and also the, uh, the Certificated and Classified Supervisors Bargaining Unit, as well as the San Diego Education Association related to phase one appointment based on site learning for the 2020 2021 school year. This is just, as I was previously mentioning, uh, phase one, this is the agreement with uh, the employee groups uh, to move forward on this phase. Um, is there a motion on this item? So moved. So moved by Trustee Beiser. Seconded. Seconded by Trustee Whitehurst-Payne. Uh, any uh, comments on the great cooperation we've had with our employee groups? Yes, we have public comment on this We item. have public comment on this item. Okay, uh, this is item uh, G2. Um, okay, go ahead with the public comment, Ms. Stoltz. There are four uh, submissions for public comment on item G2. The first is from OG. I support the phase one appointment-based on-site learning opportunities for the 2020-2021 school year. Please vote yes. Question number one, can the San Diego Unified School District include the status of the criteria for reopening schools to the news release section? And question two, what does phase two entail? The next comment is from Taco Jones. I'm writing to support the phase one appointment-based on-site learning opportunities for the 2020-2021 school year. Can all of the schools please reopen for half the students on Monday and Wednesday and the other half on Tuesday and Thursday? Use substitutes, college seniors, teaching aides paid at an hourly rate with no benefits if full-time union member teachers don't want to teach in person. Uh, the next comment is from Heidi Von Bloom. While appointment-based learning is a good step toward providing education to students in the district, parents and children need to understand what the district is doing to prepare the classrooms for all students to receive in-person instruction. Please include the community in these preparations. Many sectors have returned to work and there is nothing more essential than education. Thank you. And the final comment is from Anonymous. My husband and I are both essential workers and we have a kinder and first grader who attend an amazing San Diego Unified School. We appreciate all the hard work that their teachers and principal have put into the distance learning program so far, but this form of education is unacceptable for children, especially of elementary age. The district's phase one agreement with SDEA only applies to students who fall below standard or have an IEP. What about the thousands of students who do not fall under those criteria? When will the general education students have an option to attend in-person learning? There is a decrease in kinder enrollment because elementary age children lack the attention span to sit in Zoom meetings all day. We urge you to put the students' needs first and open San Diego Unified Schools, specifically elementary schools, for those who wish to attend in person. And that concludes public comment on that item. Okay, uh, we've already had the motion on this item. So now uh, for comments, uh, Trustee Brer. Yeah, thank you, President Evans. I, I think it might be helpful, and I know it's preliminary, but if uh, Superintendent uh, Martin, if you may be able to ask uh, Drew Rollins and Noemi Viegas, who are here in the meeting, to just describe a little bit 
about what the health and safety preparations we're doing on our campuses to as we prepare for uh, bringing students back in phase one. And let me just uh, interject for a moment on this item. There are uh, interpretation services available. And as I said earlier, Spanish, Vietnamese, Somali, Tagalog, Swahili, and Arabic. And uh, the phone numbers will at different times be displayed on the screen. Okay, Superintendent Martin. Thank you, uh, President Evans and Vice President Barrera. Uh, you asked for um, Mr. Rollins and Dr. Viegas to give an update. Mr. Rollins, if you'd like to begin with an update on the protective measures that we are putting in place for our students, protective equipment and shields and those kinds of things. And then we'll ask Dr. Viegas to talk about some of the other supports. Certainly, good evening. Um, so as uh, I believe you're aware, we've been working on this issue for a while, procuring what we believe to be the proper equipment and also doing the work we feel we need to do to make sure the school site is ready. Um, when I think about the classroom, there are a number of areas we're working on. Uh, first of all, uh, we believe student and staff alike will be wearing a face covering, and we have reusable face coverings uh, that we will provide to both student and staff, a, a quantity of reusable, so not just one reusable per person, but multiple for that person. We have disposable face coverings that we will maintain on site uh, for those that forget theirs or whatever. We will have capacity that everyone will be able to wear a face covering, uh, a face mask on site. Uh, we have face shields for our teachers. Um, for those who would like to wear one, we have ample supplies of those. Uh, in the classroom, we know ventilation is a big issue and a big concern. The PPO maintenance staff has been working our way through our ventilation systems, figuring out what the systems can accommodate, uh, what can the systems accommodate to provide the maximum of maximum amount of fresh air in the classroom. Um, we are adjusting our controls so the systems run longer. That again is kind of the the, the typical protocol is to run our systems longer again to clear out as much air as we can. Where we feel we don't have uh, the ability to have a higher level of filtration within our ventilation systems, um, we also uh, have procured and are, or will be will be providing air purifiers in the classroom. Um, so we're we're very uh, aware and working our way again through the ventilation system of the classroom. Obviously, the other thing we all talk about daily disinfecting. We have EPA list N disinfectants that we have procured. They're the right disinfectant to use to combat COVID. And we have um, a supply of disinfectant sprayers. The idea again of, of disinfecting the classroom every day once it's occupied. Uh, we have procured desk shields as barriers between students and between student and teacher uh, to, to again provide a further level of segregation and separation there. Um, Hand washing is obviously a, fan, a foundational component of COVID prevention. Uh, we have adequate supplies of soap and paper towels. We have reinforced over and over with our custodial staff the importance of maintaining those supplies and checking those supplies throughout the day. Uh, we have hand sanitizer provided in every, uh, every classroom, every space on a school campus and at our admin sites. Uh, and then we have a combination of both freestanding hand sanitizer stands as well as um, portable hand, hand wash stations that we will distribute throughout the campus. Uh, think about those being in common areas. I think finally, I would just touch on we have been working with our school sites and we'll be, we'll be providing a mix of signage. Uh, you know, things of reminding about hand washing, of people keeping social distancing, of um, perhaps one way traffic in a hallway, et cetera. So we have a library of signage. We have a mix that is some is professionally, professionally produced, some that we will produce on a color printer, and then we have tapes and markings and those kind of things. So that in general, I think from my perspective, are the things we're doing. I think I caught them all, but uh, we're, we're continuing to work and learn and, and get through it. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Drew, because I think it's very important for people to know that we are in constant preparation for uh, the in-person learning so we can hit the ground running when we're ready to do it, including on phase one. Okay, and uh, Noemi. Hi, everyone. Thank you for inviting us to speak to these very important items. Uh, the other piece, in addition to what Drew mentioned, I think is important to say in this meeting is that we have a comprehensive team of health experts, including our um, experts from UCSD, all of our teams inside the district, Drew's team, which encompasses uh, various departments from facilities, operations, all of those departments that he very gracefully leads every day. And from our perspective, all of our nurses, health techs, uh, health technicians, all of the um, medical professionals that help us with the communication with the county, the communication with the guidelines of the state. So we have a comprehensive list of individuals that are helping us keep our students safe, first and foremost, our staff safe, in um, our family safe. So in addition to the procedural and facilities preparations that we have, we also understand that having a healthy mindset, thinking about the education that we need to have and provide for our community is as critical. So helping students anticipate routines as we are moving forward into phase one, explaining what those routines look like when the students are at home, what is the parent going to do and what is the student going to do upon arrival, working with our nurses and our health tech teams and all of our different um, principals, leaders, all of our staff to ensure that everybody has the education that they need in preventative health care and supports for students. Um, the this, this shifting of mindsets, right? What does it mean to come to school now under phase one? And what are the precautionary things that we need to have? For example, uh, a daily checklist, to ensure that the campus is safe and ready. Those ongoing commitments with our families of what does it mean when um, you come on campus and what is our commitment to you? We are extremely committed to, en committed to ensure that all of our families feel comfortable, that we follow the, the uh, safe and healthy uh, guidelines and they're pretty comprehensive. So we also have information for families so that before they come to school, or any um, on-site appointment, they have the information that they need to anticipate what is going to happen during that learning time. And we are able to provide um, a student and family guideline. So we are in constant collaboration with a variety of stakeholders and Drew and I, Susan, Dr. Terras, we are fully committed to ensuring that our communities are safe. And first and foremost, like I said, the safety of our students, because we understand the critical nature of um, just thinking about reopening of our campuses and all of that is encompassing of a lot of very committed individuals that um, are guiding this work. No, no, thank you both, uh, Drew and Noemi. And I know that this is work that you've been doing in cooperation with our uh, principals and site leaders actually for quite some time now. And so it, it certainly gives us confidence that uh, as we uh, go into phase one, um, we've got a plan, we've got uh, resources, uh, and, and as Noemi, as you pointed out, we'll be doing the education with everybody who's on a, on a school campus uh, to make sure that we've got a healthy mindset. So thank you so much for, for that hard work. And Vice President Barrera, I just wanted to add to what you heard from um, Dr. Villegas and Mr. Rollins that another item coming up tonight is our LCP and there's a chart in the learning continuity plan that outlines the $45 million in expenditures um, that includes the PP and all the other kinds of things that we've purchased to some of the what you just heard Mr. Rollins um, speak about but it's in the learning continuity plan and it's um, lays it out in there as well. It's good to hear it though too. You can see it on page, well, I forgot the page number, but to also hear it live and in person, it's good to talk about it. So thank you, um, Mr. Rollins and Dr. Vegas. Okay, uh, any um, further comments on this second reading? And we're gonna have, uh, let's go to, yes, uh, Dr. Weiser's pain. Uh, just one, one question back to Drew's uh, presentation. If there's a teacher or an employee who 
feels that he or she needs that additional layer of uniform like they use in hospitals. Um, we have that also. Do we have it? Yes, we do. Yeah, I, I, I kind of broad brushed it, but uh, we have a lot of backup equipment. We have disposable gloves, disposable gowns, uh, face shields with a drape that comes down. Um, we have uh, a supply of N95 masks, but again, we do want to be cautious with using those. It uh, really should be um, for really the need where it is close contact with another person without a mask, et cetera. So we do want to walk through the process, but yes, we, at least certainly our view in, in procuring all of this is we want to make sure everyone feels comfortable and if they need something, we have it for them. Thank you. Sure, thank you. Okay, now we have public comments on this. Okay, we already did the public comment. Okay, that's why I switched the page. And Okay, um, so uh, we will now, if there's no further comments, we will now uh, vote on this item uh, G2. Um, Trustee Patterson? Aye. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, you can withdraw that, Trustee Patterson, to, due to my my error. This we're actually ratifying the the collective bargaining agreement, but we still know your opinion. Uh, okay, so that's duly noted. Uh, uh, Trustee Barrera, aye. Pfizer, aye. Uh, Macquarie, aye. Um, Whiter's Payne, aye. And Evans, aye. Okay, that passes a uh, five zero. Okay, now. As uh, Superintendent Martin was mentioning, we're moving on to the uh, district's learning continuity and attendance plan. Uh, this is the second reading and the adoption. And that's where I was also uh, just again pointing out that we do have translation services available for this, uh, for this particular item. Uh, to start off, I'd like a motion on this item. So moved. Okay, moved by Trustee uh, Beiser. Second. And seconded by Trustee Whitehurst Payne. And uh, so this is the second reading. Um, if there, we don't have a staff presentation. I don't know if uh, uh, Superintendent Martin has any comments in terms of yeah. revisions that may have taken place. Yes, I'd like to just, as you said, Dr. Evans, um, this is a second read from when we presented it before. We know from our first read was on September 8th. And as we know from that presentation, this learning continuity plan is required due to Senate Bill 98, which is in lieu of an LCAP for the 2020-2021 school year. And it's required that this is adopted by the boards of education across the state by September 30th. Um, what we mentioned in our last meeting is that we would still be conducting our stakeholder engagement between the two reads of this item. And tonight, we will have a brief overview of the changes that have occurred within the plan um, between the between the two readings. The additional feedback that we received from our stakeholders, including our advisory groups like the CAC, the DAC, the DLAC, and then surveys that we received have provided us input. And that input's allowing us to strengthen the existing language in the plan. And then it allows us to also include language that didn't previously appear in the plan. So you'll see within our stakeholder engagement section, the questions that were posed from these groups and based on those questions that we listed, then the additions that were included in the plan. So while the survey has closed, we will continue to seek feedback all year long, and we will maintain our LCAP at sandy.net email, as well as our phone line for feedback. And that number, again, I said it last time, is 619-260-5430. And this LCP is currently available in five different languages, English, Spanish, Arabic, Swahili, Somali, Tagalog, and Vietnamese. I just wanted to say that one thing that's new in addition to the plan and important to highlight tonight is our continu or continuation of our Parents as Partner series. The parent and family feedback for us is a really important component of our success as we continue to navigate through these unprecedented times and enhances our overall success for all of our students. So we'll be hosting these sessions ongoing all year long. And I want our parents and our families to know that they're invited into the sessions with district leadership so that they can provide us feedback as it relates to the experiences that they're having 
during the school year and feedback is not a one-time thing, it's an ongoing thing. And these meetings are gonna be translated for families who don't speak English um, in their homes so that everybody has access. So I'm also happy to highlight as of today, students have checked out 83,509 devices and the district has provided approximately 2,450 internet connections to any family who needed it. So if you or your fa any family you know are still in need of a device or in need of an internet connection, please don't hesitate to reach out to our family internet helpline, 619-260-2460. Okay, thank you. Now we do have a uh, public comment on this item. Uh, so I'm gonna ask us to, since there are several of this and we should be able to get through all nine of them to ask uh, both board officers to participate in this. So if you look about six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 pages in there's it says H1 at the top of one of the pages, that's where it begins. Uh, the name of the first speaker is uh, Sarah Davis. So it's a little ways in there, about 10 pages in. So we'll start with Ms. Stoltz and then we'll just rotate around so that we can hear the comments that our public have submitted on this item about the district's learning continuity and attendance plan. Yes, the first uh, comment is from Sarah Davis. I am a student at UCSD. It is important to ensure that the learning continuity and attendance plan prioritizes equity and the needs of students who have been historically underserved by our public schools. This plan should include funding for access to free technological devices, Wi-Fi connection needs, and mental health supports for students. In addition, the district should be sure to support students who may stop attending school at this time due to personal struggles. For example, students struggling with drug addiction and mental health issues may find it extra difficult to show up to classes online and as a result not graduate. Counselors and mental health support staff should be utilized to assist students and track students who stop coming to school. More imp most importantly, students who may be truant should not be criminalized, but rather engaged with in a compassionate manner. We must address the local continuity and attendance plan as it is intended to be equitably. As an elected official, we call on you to act on the asks you heard today from the community stakeholders within your district. Thank you. This comment is from Ann Elliott. There's a little bit of an echo here. Uh, good afternoon, Board of Education. My name is Ann Elliott. I live in North Park. I am concerned about the many poor families, especially those with a single parent who must work for a living, but who have children who will be at home because of the pandemic. Even with electronic devices provided to these families uh, and Wi-Fi set up in poor neighborhoods, how will these children, especially those not fluent in English, be able to navigate six hours of instruction a day. Even more worrisome, what happens to those children who won't have Wi-Fi in their own homes? It seems like nearly impossible expectation that these children will be able to keep up with class standards. What can the schools do to help children in these circumstances? Tablets and Wi-Fi alone are not enough without adult oversight and direction. Okay, this comment is from Casey Ozwan. I am a community member. It's important to ensure that the learning continuity and attendance plan prioritizes equity and the needs of students who have been historically underserved, underserved by our public schools. This plan should include funding for access to free technological devices to every single student that needs one, free and reliable Wi-Fi connection, and free mental health support for students. In addition, the district should invest in making sure a diverse curriculum that gives a voice to educators who provide different points of view is being taught. We must address the local continuity and attendance plan as it is intended to be equitably. As an elected official, we call on you to act on the asks you heard today from community stakeholders within your school district. The next comment is from Nicole Schwartz. I am a San Diego community member. It is, a vi it is vital that the learning continuity and attendance plan prioritizes equity and specifically the needs of students who have been historically underserved by our public schools. This involves funding, access to free Wi-Fi, and updated technological devices for all students. In addition, the district must ensure adequate technical support staff and aids to help guide parents who are not technologically savvy 
and supporting their children at home. Lastly, it is imperative that the plan fund mental health support resources for students. We must address the local continuity and attendance plan as it is intended to be equitable. As an elected official, we call on you to act on the asks you heard today from myself and other community stakeholders within your district. Uh, the next comment uh, is from Fanny Contreras, uh, which she submitted in Spanish. So I guess we're giving Spanish and then the translation. Um, como padre y miembro de la PSRO, Organización de Padres, Estudiantes y Residentes, y un representante de mi comunidad, me gustaría instarlo a que le pida al distrito que incluya, incluya las opiniones y aportes de mi comunidad. El LSP, especialmente los estudiantes refugiados de inglés, como los estudiantes inmigrantes y los padres. Actualmente estamos experimentando las mismas dificultades que, exper que experimentamos anteriormente. El distrito dice que se están comunicando con los padres, pero solo lo hacen con aquellos padres que no necesitan traducción. Este documento dice mucho, pero no hay garantía de que alguien escuche y aborde las necesidades de los estudiantes y padres en vías de aprender inglés. As a parent, and member of the PSRO Parent Student Resident Organization and a representative of my community, I would like to ask that you tell the district to include the opinions and input of my community. The LCP looks okay, but it does not represent the input from all the parents and students, specifically students and parents who are refugees, English learners, and migrants. We are currently experiencing the same difficulties that we experienced before. The district says that they are communicating with parents, but they only communicate with parents who do not need translation. This document states a lot, but there is no guarantee that someone will listen and move forward to address the needs of students and parents who are English learners. Okay, this comment is from Tamara Hurley. It is clear that most children in San Diego Unified will be receiving online instruction for the foreseeable future. Yet the San Diego Unified LCP doesn't contain any, any mechanism by which to collect feedback from parents and guardians, the co-educators, during this distance learning. You can't just talk about parents as partners, but then treat them like students, giving them a website with resources and online tutorials. You need to give parents and students a voice to know what is working or not working and how the students and families are faring during distance learning. Prove that the words parents as partners are more than just a catchy phrase. Let a parent-led task force create surveys to solicit feedback from parents to help determine best practices and better serve your students and families during distance learning. The next comment is from Lucas Goodman. I'm a student in San Diego. It is important to ensure that the learning continuity and attendance plan prioritizes equity and the needs of students who have been historically underserved by our public schools. This plan should include funding for access to free technological devices, Wi-Fi connection needs, and mental health supports for students. Additionally, I feel the district should implement curriculums that actively address anti-racism with students. My education was widely Eurocentric based and failed to recognize the realities of racial injustice and oppression that have been systemically rooted in our country for the past 300 years. We must address the local continuity and attendance plan as it is intended to be equitably. As an elected official, we call on you to act on the asks you heard today from community stakeholders within your school district. This public comment is from Tanja Pijakowski, and I'm a community member who volunteers with local public schools around the county. Students have been greatly impacted by the COVID-19 crisis, but it is critical that we do not let them fall behind any more than they have already because of solvable problems like lack of access to Wi-Fi or devices needed to log in. We should be particularly mindful about low-income students who need extra assistance due to their family's low income level to ensure equity among San Diego students' educational opportunity. These conditions are also having a large impact on students' mental health, and we should ensure that they also have access to counseling. Equity should be a top priority. As an elected official, we ask that you follow through on the request that you heard today from community members from your district. Okay, and this uh, last comment is from Brittany McKnight, who is the education chair of the NAACP San Diego branch. 
Good morning. We would like to submit the comments listed below as public testimony for today's board meeting. Thank you. We're still deeply concerned about the lack of notification to the public regarding the LCP and opportunities for stakeholders to provide feedback. Once again, we found no information about the LCP on the district's social media, and their survey is still only available in two languages. Also, several concerns about the district's LCB, LCP have been brought to our attention, so, such as the lack of inclusion of the student voice. We implore the district to do more to ensure that the voices of students and all stakeholders are heard, and that feedback from all stakeholders is incorporated into the LCP. Lastly, it is imperative that the district revise the current LCP in order to better reflect the district's 2020 Freedom Summer Resolution and Workshop, commitments to anti-racist reforms, and to implementing meaning meaningful changes to dismantle inequitable and racist practices in the district, which the current LCP fails to acknowledge. Thank you. Okay, that concludes the public comment on this item. I know that a lot of the public comment had to do with um, with devices and Wi-Fi, and we certainly are doing a lot in terms of making sure every student has uh, the device that they need and also the Wi-Fi connections. Another thing that was brought up about students who are at home who, who, without parents or without parents who are able to assist them, particularly because of language difficulties, and that's really part of phase one, which is to identify those students who are most falling behind under the distance learning to give them uh, extra help uh, with some uh, in-person contact. Um, are there any other um, comments from board members about this uh, agenda item? Uh, start with Trustee Patterson. Thank you, Dr. Evans. I wanted to just get the opportunity to ask with um, so everyone can hear. I wanted to hear a little bit more about what we're doing to fit English language learners into the reopening process and where specifically they come in. So say I'm a secondary English language learner. So I'm in, let's say I'm a ninth grader with an English language learner. Where am I in the process of being brought back to school and what additional resources am I being given right now? Thank you, Trustee Patterson. I have Dr. Roditi and Ms. Bustani that would like to um, join this conversation. I know that they're on our panel and ready to participate. Hi, thank you, um, Trustee Patterson, for that question, and um, Superintendent Martin. One of the things that we have to clarify is that, Trustee Patterson, you asked the question specifically about high school students, and we have not um, set forth a plan for bringing back our high school students to uh, on-site learning yet, so that wasn't part of our phase one. Uh, but in, in relation to our, how we're addressing the needs of English learners, there is a, an entire section in the learning continuity plan that addresses how we will continue to assess students uh, with the LPAC assessment, both initial and the summative assessment. And it outlines specifically how we will continue to support our English learners through um, both designated and integrated ELD. So there is a section in the continuity plan that uh, outlines how we're, how we're supporting our English learners. And over this distance learning period right now, I know that I've hit the ground running pretty hard in high school so far, and I've learned quite a lot in the past few weeks. And it would definitely be concerning if I'm an English language learner who, when I walk on campus in X amount of time, that's my first real exposure to the information I'm supposed to be learning in the school year. Are we still seeing, do we have, from our first weeks of school so far, have we seen that it's an issue communicating with English language learners or are we being having success? Sorry to put you on the spot on this question. Um, tell me more about what you mean in terms of communicating because we yeah. have, we have a tiered approach to ensure that we're making connections with all of our students. So our English learners are included in that, but we do have a tiered approach to monitor both um, daily connection in synchronous instruction, also participation, and we're also monitoring if students are submitting or completing assignments. Okay, interesting. And you can, and is that, that is split up based off of different groups? Or is that just a general 
percentage? It's just ge- it's just general in terms of all students, but we are um, paying attention to our most vulnerable learners, which would be our students with disabilities and our English learners. Okay. And are we seeing success so far in that category? Are students, are we doing a decent, I mean, considering the situations, are we still having students that are able to participate, turning in work? Do you feel positive and optimistic about how that's moving forward currently? Yes. Um, so we're, we're hearing, a, hearing a lot of feedback from principals around our connection teams. And um, just to provide more clarity, our, all of our central office resource teachers are actually deployed to school sites, not uh, physically, but virtually. And everyone, it's kind of like an on, all hands on deck approach to ensure that if there's a student who is not connecting, that we're all working toward um, figuring out what's preventing that student from connecting. Um, Area superintendents are closely monitoring these connection teams and they're meeting with them on a consistent basis. And then we even have team leads who are pulling up uh, school attendance reports on a daily basis. So it's something that we're staying very close to. And it's not just about ensuring that a student logged in one time during the week or one class. For secondary schools, we're even looking to see that they're logging into all of their classes that they had that day. So it's something that we're monitoring closely. Um, I hope that answers your question, Trustee Patterson. Yeah, definitely. Looking forward to seeing maybe as we get, as we move forward, I'd love to see some more results for our specifically vulnerable populations, but I really appreciate the work you're doing right now and thank you. You're welcome. To add to what um, Dr. Rodidi was saying, thank you, Trustee Patterson and President Evans for that question. Um, In addition, we have equipped all of our San Diego Unified School District educators with um, powerful, robust professional development around supporting the needs of our English learners. Um, During the first week of school, we provided learning opportunities around how to provide quality um, ELD, integrated ELD across all of our classrooms. So teachers took part in that learning and they're taking that learning and they're actually putting it into practice um, within the the context a variety of content areas. So they are equipped and poised now to take on that learning and to ensure that we are meeting students at their point of need. So we're very proud that we have um, had this unprecedented opportunity, unprecedented opportunity to train all of our educators. Every educator had access to this learning and they're implementing it within the structures of their, their, um, their learning, their planning and the delivery of instruction. So we're very proud of that. And I would say that's all related to what's been done in recent years, which would be this, um, we call it the mainstreaming of, of uh, English language learners in terms of them being integrated in the classrooms and all of the, all of the faculty being trained on how uh, to work with them rather than in a segregated manner. And we had a lot of great stories coming out of Kearney High School of students who started, started at high school uh, not knowing English and, and were very successful um, graduates of, of that high school. And so I'm, I'm sure you're just carrying that on in the online world too. Any other comments or questions by uh, board members on the learning continuity plan? Uh, just related to what um, you were just discussion, discussing, um, measurable outcomes. I know one of the things that we were concerned about the last time was the lack of measurable outcomes. So as we go down the road, the kind of markers that we'll be looking for, not specifically to say teacher X did such and such, but to be able to say, we know that 95% of our students logged into classes uh, daily or for each class. I mean, what are the kind of tangible measurable outcomes we expect to look at this year? That's a great question. One of the things that is also included in the continuity plan is our um, efforts towards developing a comprehensive assessment plan that provides schools both academic and social emotional diagnostic assessments Um, formative assessments that uh, schools can use. So we are launching or piloting 
some really uh, cool, for lack of a better word, assessments this year, particularly um, in math. We'll, we'll continue to do the reading. Um, for, we'll continue to do FAST uh, assessment for reading, DRA in the elementary schools. Those are things that we will continue. Um, for math, we'll continue with our benchmark assessments. We're, um, we're piloting a new assessment, actually, that um, highlights the type of critical thinking and problem solving that we want our students to be able to demonstrate. So it's not just the calculation, but more focused on explain, having kids explain their answer. And then on um, connected to mental health and social emotional learning, we will also be piloting the, this year two different measures that will help us um, be able to assess which students have um, specific needs so we can address those right away. Specifically now that our students aren't in front of us every day, um, it's more important that we're able to uh, diagnose what students' uh, needs are so we can provide them the intervention as soon as possible. Um, to answer the first part of your question, um, Dr. whitehurst Payne, we are ensuring that we're keeping both quantitative and qualitative data connected to this continuity learning plan. So we're both measuring the progress goals that we have um, concerning PD and other things, but also student outcome goals, which are very important to us. I hope that answers your question. It does, and thank you for that. For In order to get to the end and not have garbage, as they say, garbage in, garbage out, but if you've already designed it with that thought in mind, of what you want to see quantitatively and qualitatively for data, that would be good. Thank you. Yeah, and just to add that we, the team has spent a lot of time thinking about not just measuring um, academics, but also how students are progressing social emotionally. It, it's critical. So we're, we're doing some creative and innovative things this year with some, with some partners. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Evans. Okay. Thank you for those questions and comments. Uh, if there are no further comments, uh, uh, Trustee Brer, sorry. Uh, thank you, President Evans. Uh, Superintendent, if you could just comment on a, or ask somebody to comment on um, two issues that we heard in the public comments. One, uh, what's the work to translate the LCP into various languages and to allow uh, people who speak various languages to give their voice in, in, into the uh, into the uh, process, and then um, how are we incorporating the anti-racism efforts that we discussed at the Freedom Summer Workshop? I know we've got an update coming up at a, a board meeting soon on those efforts, but how are we incorporating those efforts into the LCP? Thank you. Trustee Barrera, first I'll tell you that about, let me talk about the language issue first and then we'll talk about Freedom Summer. The LCP is currently available in the seven languages that I mentioned, English, Spanish, Arabic, Swahili, Somali, Tagalog, and Vietnamese. And then continuing with the Parents as Partners series, we will have translation available to translate to any family that doesn't speak English so that they can participate in that, um, in the, in that series in an ongoing way. So those, that's how we'll continue to address language and continue to provide the language translation that are needed for any family or student even that needs to participate in the process as we have that be an ongoing. That's something we heard in the feedback from the first read was that we wanted to continue the parent input and we wanna make sure it's in all of the languages. So that's continuing um, and the language translations will be there. And then Dr. Rodidi or Ms. Bustani, do you wanna talk about the equity things that we're incorporating into the work that we're doing. I know Ms. Bustani, you spoke about the professional development that we had. There was a strand through the professional development when we had the week of professional learning um, to launch this school year around these practices. And they were some of the most powerful sessions. I got to personally attend a couple of them, very powerful, but I'll let um, Dr. Aditi and Ms. Bustani speak to how it's incorporated and whether or not it was reflected in the LCP and where we're going with this so people know that that's core to our mission and the work going forward this year. Um, so we've committed to doing ongoing board presentations uh, and they're going to be updates on 
our Freedom 2020 work. And so that's going to, you'll see updates throughout the year for the board regarding that board workshop and our new uh, Black Youth Call to Action. Um, I'll also say that we are very excited that this year we added um, a tab or a section in every school single plan for student achievement that calls out the specific actions they will take connected to our Black Youth Call to Action. So schools are current in the process of developing um, specific goals related to every action item in our call to action. And um, Debbie's, Debbie Foster's team has done a tremendous job of creating a template for the single plan for student achievement that's directly aligned to the work that we're leading this year around Black youth. So we're very excited about that. Um, the LCP asks ask us to specifically uh, call out um, how we're going to use funding for foster youth, low income and special education students. And so it doesn't necessarily call out uh, what we're doing for black students. So we have scheduled some workshops over the summer. Um, you'll hear an update on October 13th uh, to be part of that work, but it's not necessarily uh, called out in the LCP. We did in fact um, include um, other information um, that was specific to our block grant that may have some uh, black students included in that as targeted students um, and that it does live in that part of the LCP plan. No, thank you. And, and as Superintendent Martin said at the beginning, um, you know, the process for uh, engagement around the LCP is ongoing and so uh, as we move forward and as we are uh, incorporating our anti-racism uh, efforts uh, throughout everything that we're doing in the district and as we have our regular uh, board updates, um, we may want to uh, reference those in the LCP so that if somebody, if somebody's first, um, you know, uh, shot at understanding what we're doing is the LCP, uh, you know, we might want to make sure that they're aware of, of those efforts. Um, okay. that's, great. that's great feedback, Trustee Barrera. If okay. I may add to, if I may add to this, um, to the question around how the Educator PD series that we provided over the summer, we had a thread around culturally, culturally responsive and sustaining teaching practices and ethnic studies. Um, we studied how to equip our educators with restorative justice practices. So we have best practices that we've provided our, our teachers, our educators around these um, topics on how to interrupt um, anti-bias practices, how to implement anti um practices that interrupt um, inequities even within the classroom and as a school system. So we're very proud that we launched that work and we continued, will continue to provide ongoing professional learning, not only for our principals through our institutes, but through our online series for our educators moving forward. And we also appreciate the great work that uh, Ms. Bastani is doing and as well as her <laughs> kindergarten kid. And, and that's She's quite not, all right. That's, say it's, hi. We want to say hi to them. <laughs> <laughs> only if you want to. Only if you want to. I'll say hi. He's a kindergartner at Benchley Weinberger. Hi. Uh, hi. He's a board member. <laughs> yes, he's at Benchley Weinberger and um, Amazing work at Benchley Weinberger, um, amazing support providing for our students. They are in guided reading groups. They're being provided quality learning experiences. So um, this is a testament to all of the amazing collaboration and, and teamwork across our system. My children are benefiting um, tremendously and that's because of our team and what we've done. So we're very proud, very proud parents. Great. Ms. Great. Donnie, thank you for sharing your children with us. Not only your brilliance, but also your children. And we're loving seeing hey, them. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> they were star I only I only mentioned it because they were stars of some of the videos that we've she's already had her children be part of the videos that she shared. Otherwise, it would not have asked you to do that. But you have so graciously shared your brilliance, but also your children as a parent in our district. So when he oh, came in through the background, I said, there he is. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead, Trustee Rogers. I'd like to make a, one other comment about the language. Two weeks ago, or whenever it was we last met, 
when we were discussing this item, apparently when the meeting was not being translated into Spanish in some other languages. So hopefully, um, and, and Delia from Mid City contacted me during the meeting and couldn't get it up. But Andrew promises me that today we have the languages up. So hopefully folks are logging in using the numbers that you've been talking about so that they can access this discussion today. Dr. Thank Whitehurst, you. I can tell you that right, I know you can't see it because we're in the Zoom webinar, but I can tell you right now, on the TV broadcast, the phone numbers are on the screen. I can see them now in each language and what phone number to call. So uh, Mr. Sharp told you they were there and they are there tonight and the phone numbers are, are live on the screen for people that are watching on ITV is what I can see. Thank you. I think uh, Trustee Patterson had another question or comment. Yeah, thank you, Trustee Evans. That was a lot of fun, actually. <laughs> we, didn't have a, we didn't have a student presentation today, so. We exactly. That, that, was, that was the student presentation. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to ask, uh, you mentioned, I believe it was Dr. Rodidi, you, you mentioned, I'm sorry if I messed up your last name, by the way, um, but I believe you mentioned something about the school sites specifically working to increase or working to meet certain racial equity goals. And I wanted to ask, how does that work? Is that going through our school site councils or site governance teams? because these all provide really good opportunities to meet with the students at the school site. And I know just from speaking, I was lucky enough to sit in with my Black Students Union this past week, and it was so insightful to hear their experiences on campus and a school that I've never considered even half of the issues that they've faced. And when we talk about these racial equity goals, bringing in these groups that can be representatives of this, I think if we could go on the school site level, that could be critical. So I wanted to hear how we're how principals are coming up with this and their processes that they're doing. Uh, yes, so I'll provide a little bit more insight on that. Um, every year, a school has to write a school plan for student achievement. And principals do not write these plans in isolation. They actually do it in collaboration with their leadership teams. So um, their professional learning communities, their instructional leadership teams, their school site councils all take a critical uh, role in developing the school um, plan for student achievement and actually approving it. And um, in past years, we've developed what we call um, call to actions that are specifically focused on some of our underperforming subgroups of students. So two years ago, we launched one for um, students with disabilities, and then we had another call to action specific to our English language learners. And this year, connected to the work that we're doing with Freedom um, Summer 2020 workshop, we felt that it was necessary to also create a specific call to action that was um, completely aligned with our board presentation and what schools needed to do that was that basically what we said we were going to do uh, during that board workshop. And um, they're developing these plans now. They're due in early October, but they are engaging their different committees and councils at the site level to basically develop and approve the plan. Okay, uh, if there are no further comments. Uh, we will vote on approving uh, the submission of this item to the state, uh, which is our plan. Um, let's start with uh, Trustee Patterson. Aye. Barrera. Aye. Pfizer. Aye. McQuarrie. Aye. Whitehurst Payne. Aye. And Evans, aye. That passes 5 0 along with our student uh, board member. We will now move on to item H2 uh, the issuance and negotiated sale of $300 million of Proposition Z bonds and $545 million of Measure YY bonds. Uh, is there a motion on this item? So moved. Okay, moved by Trustee Beiser and seconded Second. by? Second. By Trustee Barrera, okay. Um, are there, we have no public comments on this item. Um, so if there are no questions or comments from board members about the approval of this, so we can continue forward with all of our great 
construction projects across the district. And um, Dr. Evans, I was just going to mention that with this, the, these bonds were successfully sold and issued on August 27th at an aggregate true interest rate cost of 2.54%, which was one of the lowest ever achieved for a long-term bond sale of the district. Okay, very good. So we can continue with our uh, construction and probably right now when students are not in school for a little while, they can work overtime to get some more stuff done. Okay, uh, let's uh, vote on this item. Um, let me see here. Trustee Patterson? Aye. Barrera? Aye. Pfizer? For air conditioning, aye. Uh, yes, aye, aye for AC. Um, and for, uh, let's see here, uh, where we left off, uh, Macquarie? Aye. And um, Whitehurst Payne? Aye. And uh, Evans, aye, which passes 5-0 along with our student board member. And um, it is a an irony that just as we are completing the final phase of air conditioning and we're having a heat wave, uh, our students are unfortunately not able to be in our beautiful classrooms. Okay, we will now move forward to the uh, superintendent's uh, consent agenda. Items I-7 and 40 were previously withdrawn by the staff. I do not believe we have any uh, public comment on uh, superintendent's consent agenda items. Uh, uh, Trustee Barrera moves the item and seconded by Trustee Whitehurst Payne. Uh, we will go through the votes. Uh, let's start with uh, Whitehurst Payne. Aye. Uh, McQuarrie? Aye. Pfizer? Aye. Barrera? Aye. And out of order, even though it was supposed to be first, uh, Patterson? Aye. <laughs> and Evans? Uh, aye. Okay, that passes 5-0 along with our student board member. And we are now going to go to uh, public participation and non-agenda testimony. Now we have uh, a huge amount of uh, people who have requested uh, public testimony. Um, and so, first of all, according to our bylaws, there are, uh, for non-agenda items, it is up to uh, 15 minutes on any uh, particular subject. Um, we've divided into um, about three different subjects, although um, there's a lot of overlap in terms of the phase one and, and early childhood and special education and the opening of schools and the first two categories. So to let the other readers know on what we'd like to do on um, the first group, which is number one, if we're going to go on num uh, from number one through number five, starting with Cambria Walsh and then down on the next page to McKenzie. And then we, we, these are, and just so people understand, because we cannot read all of the items, uh, they are, uh, we are reading them uh, in the order that they are received. And, uh, but people need to know that every uh, item is printed out and uh, uh, presented to um, all of the uh, board members for them to review every single item, not just the ones that we have time to read at this uh, board meeting. So we can start with this first group um, with uh, Cambria Walsh. Yes, this testimony is from Cambria Walsh. While I appreciate that the district created guidelines for how much synchronous versus asynchronous time for elementary age children, the amount of time on Zoom in a class of 29 second graders is not effective. We are three weeks in and my children, both of whom have IEPs, are constantly saying they hate Zoom. This one size fits all approach is detrimental to children and families. The teachers are working hard, but they cannot engage children in such large groups, nor can they identify the different levels of learning. These create ways for parents and teachers feedback to be heard. Give us guidelines about what flexibility we can, we can have to support our children and their individual and our family's needs. It truly feels like boxes are being checked to say that our kids are online enough time to meet the standards versus them actually learning. Uh, this, this comment is from Brian Victor. Models predict an increase in COVID-19 transmission in the fall and winter months. Should parents expect Santa Unified School District to be remote only for the majority, if not all, 
of the 2020-2021 school year. Okay, this comment is from Edward Ewing. The overriding problem with distance learning is it is antithetical to any real educational experience. Socialization for a small child is not a luxury, it is a necessity, like food, water, and love. This is the way children process the world, physically through direct interaction with their peers. To offer a virtual substitute is analogous to offering the child virtual food, virtual water, or a virtual hug. It only leaves the child frustrated and desperate for the real thing. Distance learning provides nothing but a painful reminder of everything that is missing from their lives. Every year, therapists and psychiatrists treat millions of Americans for the ongoing trauma that they suffered in their youth. Distance learning is nothing more than the systematic traumatization of a generation of children. It provides nothing but a pathetic, albeit expedient, excuse for school districts that refuse to meet the challenges of reopening schools. Uh, next comment is from Mackenzie Bigler. I am writing this letter to inform you on how distance learning is going. As of now, it is not working, especially with the three by three schedule. Half of the time with Zoom, we can't get into our classes and we have to try over and over again just to be allowed on. We will be told that we were not authorized to be in a class, even if we are logged into our school accounts. When using a school computer, if a teacher posts a link that we need to use for class, there is a good chance that it will be blocked so we can't do our work. There are internet problems prohibiting kids from being in class or being able to understand what is being taught. Some students also have to miss class on a daily basis because parents work and they need to take care of siblings while their parents are at work so they can't get the education they deserve. At this point in time, the students are more likely to die from suicide than they are because of COVID-19. I think that online school should still be an option for the students who are immunocompromised or have family members that are, but the rest of us should be able to go back. Okay, the final one in this category, Karen Santee, I'd like to urge you to please begin considering reopening the schools. My youngest daughter is missing school today because she woke up despondent in tears and cries every day to being consistently stuck at home. She's extremely extroverted and outgoing and there are no activities taking place for children right now. Her fall soccer season was just canceled her scouts group can't meet in person, and she has no opportunities to be with peers. We have made the best of the situation, but to see friends, children in other states return to school in some fashion, mostly a hybrid model, while my daughter wakes up crying is distressing. I'm going to seek counseling for her, but feel incredibly helpless as a parent. Please, please start talking about the possibility of our children for going back to school. Some might be doing okay at home, but some are definitely not. Thank you for hearing my concern. Okay, we're gonna move ahead to the next uh, category, which is a few more down. And the first one in this category is uh, Ebby Sorensen. Uh, <clears throat> my name is Ebby Sorensen and my son is in early child special education separate setting preschool classroom. I would like the board to know that distance learning is not working for our family. How can my son work on play skills on a computer? I'm quite upset that the XE preschool classes are not included in the phase one reopening plan. Hundreds of private preschools have been open for months in San Diego and they have done so safely. My son and other preschoolers with IEPs are falling further and further behind. Distance learning is not appropriate for three to five year olds. Equity is at stake. Their futures are at stake. Please approve XE students to go back to in-person learning as soon as possible. Please think about our youngest, most vulnerable learners. They need you to make decisions for their future that, in, uh, that are in their best interest. Open up XE classrooms. The next comment is from Rena Levy. I am parent of an XE student. I strongly oppose schools remaining closed for in-person instruction to XE students, and I fully support San Diego Unified moving to in-person options immediately. You are blocking the most vulnerable special education population from their education, and these effects will be lifelong. Our son has 30 minutes of screen time per week FaceTiming family. Giving kids this much screen time is, is unacceptable and doing more damage than good. COVID is not more dangerous on a San Diego Unified campus than it is in Poway or La Mesa. If you don't take action soon to help our children, we will make grassroots history and recall the entire school board.
Okay, this comment is from Kimberly Tashman. My son just turned three. What started as a promising future in the early childhood special education program has taken a dismal turn and my family feels horribly let down and abandoned by San Diego Unified. He gets two measly half hours of virtual songs each week, which he can almost never sit still for, and his IEP is on hold. He falls further behind with each passing day with no end in sight. He needs in-person education, attention, and services, and yet he is being denied all of that. He has had three surgeries in his three years of life, and somehow this is his biggest hurdle yet. Please do not let him down. Reopen special education preschools and provide these children the services they need and are owed. I strongly oppose schools remaining closed for in-person instruction to XE students, and I fully support Santa Unified moving to in-person options immediately. Okay. This comment is from Emily Forgeron. Please begin phase one now. Special needs students have waited long enough. My first grader with an IEP is struggling. For two years, she has been in a general education classroom with an aide for support. Now I am her aide, sitting beside her for three hours of Zoom, which she can't tolerate. Her class has more Zoom time, but my daughter is barely able to attend to the morning blocks, so we opt out of additional time. She is significantly behind already. I worry. Will she learn to read and write, grasp math, her mental emotional state? How will she meet her IEP goals? To make matters worse, occupational therapy and speech services have not started. Families like mine are stressed and sadly have little to no confidence in your special education department's leadership and planning. Help us open our schools now for special needs children and include our XE preschoolers. The next comment is from Shannon Trombley. My name is Shannon Trombley, a parent of a first grade preschooler with an IEP. I strongly oppose schools remaining closed for in-person instruction to XE students, and I fully support San Diego Unified moving to in-person options immediately with safety precautions for young children with IEPs who are not able to learn via Zoom. My child is three years old and has a rare learning disorder and is unable to get any value from online learning. He requires hands-on instruction and assistance, including OT, PT, and ST, as stated in his IEP. It is unreasonable to expect children under 10 to learn without interaction. I urge the board members to vote to approve in-person options immediately for young students with IEPs. Okay, we are now going to move on to the next uh, category, um, which is support reopening of schools and in-person learning. At the top of the page, it will say non-agenda. Um, the name of a principal of a school, Kimberly Moore, is at the top of it. That's not actually the email that we're reading. At the bottom of the page is Mark Grado, and um, he has a typed out um, three-page letter, which starts out with hello. And uh, let me start by saying my heart some support of our teachers. Um, that is where we will begin um, this section. And so, and as I said, there's a lot of overlap on, on all of these categories uh, with the reopening of schools, even though it's 15 minutes uh, per item. Uh, on this uh, item, I'm going to ask us to uh, extend it to 20 minutes. So Ms. Stoltz, if you could set the timer for 20 minutes so that we can continue um, reading as many of these as we can in, in this category and giving us a little more time than the others. Okay, so the first uh, comment is from, just one moment please, uh, is from Mark Grotto. As I said, it is a, a rather long letter, so I'm going to uh, read as much of it as I can uh, in the interest of time for the others to be heard. Let me first start by saying I'm 100% in support of our teachers and schools at this time. I look forward to the day we're all back together in a community of parents, teachers, students, and staff. This comment is coming from someone who has spearheaded learning platform development over the past decade for some of the largest companies and organizations in the world on issues that are much more complex. We need on-demand learning in some form and we need it yesterday. I am the parent of three children, first grader at Doyle, sixth grader at Stanley, and a soon to be kindergartner at Doyle. 
At the end of last year, I heard about and witnessed an increasing number of children on calls that were home alone and blankly staring at the screen the moment they ran into a problem with the teacher's instruction or Zoom's interface. I have to keep in mind that Zoom is designed for board meeting presentations for white collar workers and not for school children learning basic math. I was optimistic over the summer that parents would be able to make arrangements and adjustments to fit this school year's challenging learning environment, but over the past week, it is looking like students are again in the same situation. The current learning environment is challenging, even in my home where I run my business one room over and my wife and I do our best to stay bouncing around the home, tending to three children. Even so, we find our own first grader blankly staring at the monitor the moment she hits a snag. And then he goes on to provide various uh, solutions, including an open video library, other suggestions about split lessons and other ways to comment upon uh, how to do this and various benefits for teachers and parents and board members while have access to that full letter, all, all the pages of that. And we'll continue on with the others who have kept within the 150 word uh, limit, starting with Russo. Okay, this is from Gita Russo, a Claremont parent. I'm the par parent of a freshman at Claremont High School. While we all understand that there is some risk to teachers and staff, my opinion is that the risk far outweighs the damage. Could we try an opt-in approach where teachers and students who feel it is safe to attend in-person teaching be able to do so? Those who do not feel this is safe can opt to stay at home. If I can take a flight and buy groceries at Bonds, I feel it is safe for the kids to attend classes where everyone is wearing a mask and the teachers can stand behind plexiglass shields, just like everyone else is doing in every other public space. I'm watching my 14-year-old slowly wither and fade and crumble, where she was once a vibrant social person. It hurts to watch. Adults are fine with remote, with remote work, kids are not. Stop this madness. By the way, I'm a well-educated liberal person, not some right-wing nut. So um, I, know a, I know there's a challenge on the, on the following one that uh, you have Ms. Stoltz, but if you could just mention that he's listed various schools that have opened without reading through all of them. And then just do the first the first few paragraphs. Okay, this is from Gina Robinson. It's not, not coming through. I'm sorry, this okay. is from Gina Robertson Smith. Our child, uh, my name is Gina Smith and I represent Bowen Smith, a second grader at Kumeyaay Elementary School, District B. I'm writing to demand that San Diego Unified reopens its campuses with options for in-person learning. Our children deserve the absolute best in America's finest city and distance learning is far from the best. Distance learning is failing our children. Distance learning is causing severe and irreparable harm to their education, emotional well-being, overall health, and their future. According to the Center for Disease Control, the best available evidence indicates that COVID-19 poses relatively low risk to school-aged children. At the same time, the harms attributed to closed schools on the social, emotional, and behavioral health, economic well-being, and academic achievement of children in both the short and long term are well known and significant. Further, the lack of in-person educational options disproportionately harms low-income and minority children and those living with disabilities. These students are far less likely to have access to private instruction and care and far more likely to rely on key school supported resources like food programs, special education services, counseling and after school programs to meet basic developmental needs. On September 1st, 2020, the County of San Diego amended public health orders to allow schools to begin reopening for in-person instruction. According to Dr. Wilma Wooten, the San Diego County Public Health Officer, all schools can reopen as early as September 1, following their school's reopening plan. The following school districts have already reopened or have plans to reopen with hybrid and distant funding options. Alpine Union, Borrego Springs, Poway Unified, Carlsbad Unified, Oceanside Unified, Cajon Valley Union, Del Mar Union, Encinitas Union, and Santee School District. Okay. It uh, continues on with various private schools, and it's quite a long list. So we will move on to the next one. And uh, the next one by Kevin Osco is uh, the same letter that was uh, just read. And so we will move from there to Heather Vinci. There is one word missing here today, common sense, which has been ignored when it comes to our kids. 
We know through CDC, AAP, and our physician partners at UCSD that kids should go back to school. They all said it. Why is it that some people take the CDC and the AAP as the most accurate information out there when it comes to anything COVID related, but when it comes to our kids, we don't listen? Well, here is the solution, plain and simple. The teachers use PPE, just as all people do day in and day out, just like RNs, physicians, grocery store workers, mail workers, police, and many more. You allow those who want to go back the option to do so. Some won't. This will allow for social distancing and hand washing. Our kids are now in private school. At least they care. Sad for children. Okay, this is from Teague Vinci. My name is Teague Vinci and I represent Lincoln in the first grade and Lawson Vinci uh, Transitional Kindergarten at Kumeyaay Elementary School District B. Children are our future. While there is data from all over the world showing that children generally do not spread the virus and can go back to school safely, there is zero data showing that the lack of social interaction and quality education caused by online learning does not have uh, long lasting effects on our children. More so, the negative effects of online learning are starting to show up on personal levels. My 11-year-old nephew, who recently moved from Colorado, is now suicidal. He has no friends, as he just moved here and does not have the ability to make friends with schools being closed. This is just one of many similar stories that are now becoming the new normal. A new normal I refuse to accept. Anyone who does anything to help a child is a hero to me. It is time for all of us to be heroes. Please open the schools immediately. So the next comment is from Leslie Hoffmeister, parent of two young learners, essential worker, licensed therapist, and advocate for reopening the schools. Watching both my children suffer with distance learning, social skills regression, learning discouragement, school avoidance, increased distractibility, loss of physical activity through play, and weight gain is heartbreaking. My heart also breaks for the many students who are my clients giving up on school feeling hopeless and lacking the resources needed to succeed. Even the CDC agrees the risks inherent with keeping schools closed are greater than the risks of coronavirus transmission. The lack of urgency in providing updates and making progress towards reopening is indefensible. We need options beyond distance learning to mitigate the severe risks and minimize harm to our children. Options such as hybrid and in-person learning models and or financial support for parents to seek alternative education, daycare, tutoring, homeschool, private or charter schools. Please act now. From Natalia Briggs, I'm a very worried mom of a first grader. I am an immigrant, I have an accent. I need my daughter to go back to school for proper learning activities, opportunities. Open the schools immediately, I need to get back to work. Please, we need in-person instruction for our kids. We can't pay a private tutor. This is from Sky Ewing. I am Sky. I am almost eight. Can you open the schools because I want to see my friends and my teacher? I don't like distance learning because it makes me feel angry and sad. The next comment is from Vincent Chen. I strongly oppose elementary schools remaining closed, and I fully support reopening our San Diego Unified Elementary Schools with options to include in-person learning. Elementary school students are the special group who are in need of more social interactions with their classmates and teachers for the development of their age. Although the schools try very hard to improve online learning, we are also at the risk of sacrificing vision and mental health for our little ones from overloaded screen time. With better planning, clear guidelines, and strict enforcement, I strongly believe that elementary schools should start to develop the plans with options to include in-person learning. Please seriously consider this request and make better decisions for our kids. From uh, Car Carmen Ponce, uh, about a month ago, you might have seen me on the news, NBC7. My son's name is Alexander Ponce. He is autistic and, and six years old. Uh, our journey in Santa Unified School District has not been easy for about a year that we've been back from Mississippi. Uh, your school district has seemed to fail my son and many other special education students. I had said on the news, Santa Unified School District needs to do better and also Santa Unified needs to stop making false promises. I may be a Navy wife, but before uh, I became a, a Navy wife, excuse me, before I became uh, a Navy wife, 
I was also a civilian mother and many civilians depend on your support uh, because like medical insurance is not paid for speech or OT and that is why special education is pushing on you guys to open up the schools. For the year I've been back in San Diego trying to find the best school, trying to find the best placement. Uh, your choice program seems to fail also children with special education like mine. I've made many calls to your district. I've been placed two different times with your district and been discriminated because of my son's disability. Now I ask you how many times you have to create a liability to keep children to get a higher quality of life without gaining an education. Distance learning is modeled for a child who is a typical, not for a child who is a special education, dyslexia, or any other type of special needs. Okay, this is from Gina Robertson Smith. Please hear our cries for help. There are hundreds of us who demand answers from San Diego Unified. Attached are just a few of the comments following our petition to reopen San Diego Unified. Why wasn't this board meeting announced via email as previously done? Why don't you have a reopening plan in place? Why are so many other districts and private schools allowed to reopen? Why do you pander to the union? You, your decisions are crippling our children. It's time you make our children the number one priority now. And, and I'm going to, what was attached there, I'll just read if They have comments from several people that made, Amanda said, my autistic son needs in-person instruction as a special needs child. The longer we're out of school, the further behind he falls. Cindy S. said, my kids are getting migraines from being on the computer all day. They are suffering greatly. Our kids need to be in school. David H. said, please allow me to manage the virus for myself. I want my grandchildren to be educated properly. Uh, DDW said, I firmly believe Sandy Unified should begin the process ASAP of getting students back in the classroom. There are many other districts in California that are quickly beginning this process with proper precautions in place. Let's get these students back in school. Their mental health and education is suffering. It's time for schools to open. Uh, and and uh, Wendy C says, every other district is open. Why can't Sandy Unified? Aaron C says, kids' mental health is deteriorating. They need to be back in school. And Adria L says, I want to be back in the classroom with the students. And we have the board members will be able to read all of the other ones. Um, the uh, next one from Gina Robertson Smith is the letter that we had uh, previously read that a few people uh, uh, submitted. So um, Ms. Stoltz, if you could continue with um, forget us. Yes, the next comment is from A.V. Bagetis. Hope you and all is well. I strongly oppose schools remaining closed and fully support opening San Diego Unified Schools for in-person learning. My three children want and need to be in the classroom and not sitting at the kitchen table looking at their computer screen. Online learning is causing more harm to their physical and mental well-being than COVID-19 ever would. Where is San Diego Unified? There has been no communication, information, updates, or plans from San Diego Unified since August 10th, which is very frustrating and stressful. I strongly encourage and urge you to please vote to approve in-person learning as soon as possible. No more excuses. Time for action. Okay, from... Gary Bousquet, we live in a country where risk-benefit analyses determine major public decisions. For example, we drive cars and roads. Despite the injury and death risks, we play sports, recognizing the social and health benefits are greater than the injury risks. As a nation, we routinely, uh, we routinely accept adverse health impacts, such as the annual tens of thousands of flu-related deaths or the completely preventable hundreds of thousands of smoking-related deaths. Now, for some inexplicable reason, we cannot tolerate a single illness. We invent capricious metrics and require onerous responses affecting everyone, including our children. We are counting on your leadership. Enough is enough. Open our schools now. Let's manage the risks to our most vulnerable citizens with the many resources we have available and stop punishing our children. It's not their fault. Okay, uh, this uh, email is from... Howard Matt. Hello, my name is Howard Matt, and I'm the father to my first grade daughter and third grade son attending Ellen Browning Scripps Elementary School in San Diego Unified. My wife and I work full time, and we live with the impossible daily task <coughs> of having to balance our career responsibilities with the education and well being 
of our two young children trying to learn on a computer screen via Zoom online apps. Despite our best attempts, we've witnessed the continued social, emotional, and educational toll that this is taking on our children. Online learning simply does not work for K-5 children and is causing extensive long-term harm. Thus, we strongly oppose schools remaining closed for in-person instruction, and I fully support San Diego Unified moving to in-person options immediately. For the health, well-being, and most important, the essential education of our children, we urge you to vote to approve in-person options immediately. This next comment is from Leslie. I am a mother of ninth and 11th graders. I would like them to return to school immediately in person. They are missing out on so much by being out of school academically and socially. They will never get this time back. There is no vaccine and if one is approved, it may not be very effective and could take a long time to distribute. Our kids can't wait. According to the American Academy of Pediatrics and the Children's Hospital Association, Severe illness due to COVID-19 is rare among children. Treatments for all people have improved dramatically. Masks and eye protection work. There is no reason to wait. They need to be in school, not in front of a computer, isolated from their teachers and peers. It is past time. Please bring them back in person at all grade levels now. This comment is from Crystal Novak, my son has ADHD. Online learning does not work for him. He needs hands-on interaction to learn. He is bright and aware of his difficulties, frustrated with himself and the expectations resulting in daily meltdowns. In June, my sweet, funny, creative, and curious eight-year-old son attempted suicide. We spent our summer rebuilding and healing. Now three weeks into the school year, the same emotions are surging back up. The expectations are beyond his abilities. He says he hates online learning, can't sit for three hours, gets lost and misses friends. We feel we have no options. He cannot go to school. We cannot opt out of school and the online does not work for him at all. We do not have the means to hire in-person help or enroll in private school. Public education is in no way meeting his needs I fully support in-person options immediately. This is from Elmira Samkulova. I am the parent of three children and I demand that San Diego Unified School District opens up schools in a live format. I also demand that the district superintendent hold weekly news conferences by updating the public on her progress and activities. It seems that she is half asleep and doesn't want to act in the interests of the society and education. This comment is from Grace McGee. It has been a few weeks of this virtual learning and I am here to tell you it is not working. I know you're doing the best you can, right? Wrong. Most of us do not feel that we are even being heard, let alone doing the best you can. The fights and frustrations of not understanding the day's agenda or math lessons and technology failures. If you have not witnessed this, then I beg you to stop telling us that you understand and start listening. Children belong in school together every day. Teachers are not supposed to work twice as hard to make half the difference with the same pay. Let me say it again. Teachers are working twice as hard to make half the difference for the same pay. Let that sink in because if you truly feel that children are getting the same education virtually as they would in person, you do not deserve a seat on the board and should immediately be banned from working in the education system. Stores are open, daycares are open, restaurants are open. The fact that schools remain closed is baffling. We are not okay with watching our children's education progress rather regress rather than improve. I strongly urge you to approve in-person learning options immediately. Excuse me. That concludes uh, the public testimony. As I said, all of the others will be uh, in written form uh, submitted. Uh, to the board members, uh, we appreciate everyone uh, sharing and please be aware that we are very aware of the great difficulties that families are experiencing um, during this time. Um, at this point, uh, we are going to conclude this meeting. Our next regular meeting will be on Tuesday, October 13th.
So that will be our next meeting. And at this point, we will adjourn the meeting for tonight. Thank you very much. Have a good night. Good job, President Evans. Good night, everybody. <laughs>